you can all hear me. Yes, I think the sound is good. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm happy to speak about, um, uh, in English they translate it as the animal in you, when I meant the animal in us, but apparently in Korean it is the animal in us, so uh, that's more closely what I'll be speaking about is the animal in us. Um, I will mostly be speaking about the novel for which I'm best known, which is Life of Pi, uh, but I have written other books. So once again, if you have questions about those books, please ask me about them. I may, in passing, talk about some of those other books after Life of Pi, because uh, they continue in my use of, uh, I continue in those books to use animals. So I might refer to those uh, in passing. Um, but I will mainly be speaking about uh, Life of Pi, the book, and possibly ruining it for those of you who have not read it. So I apologize if I ruin Life of Pi for you if you haven't read it tough. Um, so I will start by explaining how I came to write the book. And in a roundabout way, I will get to the animal in us. Um, I often find it very interesting to see how works of art are created. Less so books, to be honest, because books mostly come out of someone's brain. And there's nothing more boring than a writer's studio. It is essentially nowadays nothing but a desk with a computer on it and nothing else. It is not visually very interesting. You can't really see where uh, the roots of the book are. Um, I find, for example, paintings, how a painter came to become a painting, really interesting, all the sketches. Um, but nonetheless, there is something interesting about the journey that results in a book. And so I will describe that process for you. Uh, and in, that, in doing so, I'll illuminate, as I said, the idea of the animal in us. And I say the animal in us with a degree of irony and no irony. The degree of uh, irony is in the sense that if I asked most of you about the animal in you, you either might be slightly puzzled or you might point out to perhaps your puppy, your dog in your life, or your cat. Um, but mostly you not, it wouldn't mean anything to you, particularly the animal you, unless in some sort of cynical way of, you know, uh, the angry person who's behaving like a lion sort of thing. But it's a very exteriorized thing, a very distant thing, the animal in us. So there's a certain degree of irony in that, uh, but there's also no irony whatsoever when I speak about the animal in us. And I'll, I'll elucidate that a bit later. So um, Life of Pi was my third book. My first book was a collection of short stories. My second book was a novel. In those, there were no, there was a minimal use of animals. In my second book, my first novel, Self, there is a dog that plays a minor role. Someone at one point has a dog, it's their pet, and it's useful. I remember there was just one scene that I remember right now off the top of my head where uh, someone opens up a, a slot to put letters in and the dog's on the other side and is desperate to be let out and is sort of, you know, uh, yapping a bit and, and licking the hand. So it was, for me, a way of expressing a certain emotion of neediness. So the animal was simply being used by me to elicit a certain emotion. A fairly typical use of animal in literature as a means for us to say something about ourselves. It was just a tool. But there was that dog in self. But otherwise, I would say that if there were any animals in my first two books, it was purely incidental. There was no, cent there certainly were not central in any way. Uh, those two books, like most literary books, sold very little. They had good reviews, but sold very little. Welcome to the world of literary fiction. And so uh, at the end of my uh, second book, um, I decided that I would go uh, to India. Now, I decided to go to India because I'd been there before backpacking. And it was a country that I found exceptionally thrilling. They speak over 200 languages in India. It is... Um, not just a, a country, it is a continent, the subcontinent. It's a vast country in every sense of the word, uh, culturally, historically. Uh, uh, and I'd been there once before. I'd been there backpacking for six months. And on that first time, I knew nothing about the country. I was following a girl. I'd met a girl in, in Canada who said, I'm going to India. Why don't you meet me in a few months when I'll be there? And I said, sure, you're so beautiful. I'll go to India. And of India at that time, I knew nothing. I'd read some of the great Anglo-Indian novels, so you know, Salman Rushdie, E.M. Forrester, 
But I remember when I first thought I'd be going to India that I wasn't even sure where the various cities were. I didn't know where Delhi was in relation to Bombay. I, I knew nothing about the country, but it didn't matter. I was following this girl. And it didn't work out with the girl, but it certainly worked out with the country. I remember vividly arriving in Delhi and getting off the plane and this wall of humidity hitting me like a brick wall. And I remember being absolutely electrified. Just taking the taxi from the airport to, to Delhi, I remember finding it, something electrifying about it. And countries, in a sense, are like foods. Some of us like Italian food, some of us like French food, some of us like German food, some of us like Chinese food. It's a very personal taste. And I find countries, to a certain extent, are like that. There are some countries that we are taken by, that we take to very strongly. And India, right from the start, was like that. There was something about it. But I went there mainly because by Canadian standards, it was very inexpensive to be in India. And I was intending on working on a novel. And some of you who've read Life of Pi, if you remember the author's note, in the author's note, the author goes to India to work on a novel set in Portugal. Now, why would I go to India to write a novel set in Portugal? Now, those of you who know a lot about India will know that there are some little tiny Portuguese colonies on the periphery of India. Diu, Goa, these are former Portuguese colonies, Macau, uh, these are former Portuguese colonies in that area. That had nothing to do with it. I was going to go to India to be in a beautiful, intoxicating place writing my Portuguese novel. And my notion was that I would set myself up somewhere and, electrified by India, write my Portuguese novel at, with very little money. Because I had very little money. At that time, I had very, very little money. And I thought, why not be in India and spend less money than being in Canada, which was more expensive, and by my standards, was kind of boring. I knew Canada. So I went to India, and uh, with a typewriter, I was all set up, except the novel died. Exactly as I say in the author's note, the novel just didn't come alive. Any of you who are creative here, any of you who maybe write or paint or compose or whatever, or even cook, you're trying a recipe and it doesn't work out. You burn the eggs or something goes wrong. You burn the cake. Well, in a sense, I burnt the cake with this Portuguese novel. It just wasn't coming alive. And so I made the difficult decision of putting it aside. But suddenly, I was in India, and I didn't mean to be in India. I was going there just to find a place to work. I didn't actually intend to be in India. But now I had nothing to do. And I said I had very little money, so the cost of the airfare was a fortune. So why would I immediately go back to Canada when I was already there? So I thought, well, pff, since I'm here, I might as well be here. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but I said, I'm here. I'll, I'll stay here. I'll, you know, I'll figure maybe I will just backpack for a few months, and then I'll go back to Canada, quite defeated, but I'll go back to Canada and go on with my life. And then what happened, and it's, it, this speaks to the wonderful alchemy of the open mind. When the mind is open, when the heart is open, you start noticing things. Things come to you. Now, when you're a writer, or certainly for me as a writer, you are in a sense a bit like a vacuum cleaner. You're always sucking up things, hoping to catch something big, something that will inspire you, something that will be your next book. So here I was in India with one dead novel that I put behind me, and I was in a state of receptivity. I was in a state of openness, not necessarily consciously, but I realized I was already in my, how old was I? In my late 20s, a little bit late to be, you know, you should be getting on in life when you're in your late 20s. You should be sort of deciding on what you're going to do. And the life of the artist is very fragile. It's not like if you have a career with Samsung, for example, you could probably stay with Samsung for 40 years. When you're a writer, when you're an artist, it's very uncertain how long you can last. The world always tells you it doesn't need another novel. You know, we have plenty of other novels. We don't need your little effort. Just shut up and become a dentist or something like that. So it's a sort of a fragile thing. So here I was in India with nothing to do but be there. And so I opened my mind and I started traveling. And I remember, in fact, speaking of Portugal, I started this process uh, in Goa, which if you know India, sort of, here's India, the sort of western coast, the western coast of India. I was in this lovely Portuguese, former Portuguese colony called Goa. And from there I traveled in the south of India. I was mainly in the south of India that second time. And what happened there is over the course of a few weeks, I started noticing something that I had never noticed before in my life in a serious way. 
And those two things were manifestations of religion and animals. Now let me explain why I had never noticed those in a serious way before that. I'm from uh, what you might call French Canada, from Quebec, the province of Quebec, the province où on parle français, where we speak French. French, in fact, is my mother tongue. Um, and Quebec in the early 60s went through a, something called the Quiet Revolution, la Révolution tranquille. The Quiet Revolution was literally a matter of a couple of years in which Quebec, which up till that time was steeped in Roman Catholicism, um, suddenly, it all happened because of the 60s, the Beatles, the 60s, suddenly the province said to itself, why are we so religious when it is doing us no good? It is holding us back. It's certainly oppressing women, completely oppressing gay people. And the, the province sort of as if one person suddenly said, why are we doing this? And literally in a matter of a few years, Quebec went from being the most backward province in Canada to being the most socially progressive. Literally like one person, it turned its back on Roman Catholicism. People left the church in droves. Even priests left the church. Um, so very, very, very quickly, uh, Quebec became a fiercely secular province that completely turned its back on religion. Still to this day in Quebec, you go to these magnificent uh, Catholic churches in Montreal, and on a Sunday morning, they're pretty well empty. You will see maybe some immigrant communities, some people of you know maybe Portuguese or Italian extraction who are still a bit traditional. You will have maybe some older people, some older Quebecois in their 80s who will still go there. A few middle-aged people, very few, a few homeless people, and that's kind of it. Um, it became a fiercely secular province, not only secular but anti-religious, scathingly critical of the Catholic Church for all the things it had done to Quebec. And my parents were of that generation. My parents left the church as soon as they could. They moved to Spain to study, and they never came back to Quebec until 30 years later. And so I was the child of fiercely secular parents. When I, went, when I grew up, we never went inside a church, except for maybe tourism reason. It was a beautiful cathedral like Notre Dame de Paris. Of course, you go to Notre Dame to see how beautiful it is. You don't go there to pray, you go there to look at the art. Um, that was the only times we ever went to a church. Otherwise, religion was strictly something that you might read about in National Geographic, some distant tribe in Papua New Guinea or somewhere doing their funny little things that make no sense. And what replaced gods in my upbringing was art. My father is a poet. My parents have always loved visual arts. And so I grew up being told that if you want to understand life, you read great books, you look at great paintings, you listen to great music. So my parents, my whole childhood dragged me to museums, my brother and I, they dragged us to museums. And initially, I suspect like every child, I was completely bored. I couldn't stand going to be dragged to yet another museum. And then at one point in my teens, I suddenly woke up and say, wow, this is actually really thrilling. And so that's one thing I've been doing here in Seoul is trying to find all your art museums. I cannot get into that Lyon. It's impossible to get tickets to Lyon, which really annoys me. Um, if anyone here has an inn, get me a ticket to Lyon. I'll be very grateful. Um, but they also, you know, they encouraged me to read. And they encouraged me to listen to music. And those were the tools that they gave me to understand what it means to be human. And it worked. You know, you read great books, and it makes you cry. It makes you laugh. It makes you be someone else and live their experience, that's what great art does. It takes you out of your small little life and gives you the life of all the characters you read about. So I grew up a secular, literate young man, and quite happily so. And I was scathingly dismissive of religion, and I still am of organized religion. You know, I don't need the patriarchy. I don't tolerate sexism or homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, all the evils of Western religions. And I wouldn't know about Korea here, but certainly the evils of organized you know, Catholicism, for example, which has done a very good job of oppressing women, gays, and Jews, among other groups. Um, I don't need a bunch of old white men telling me how I should live my life. So of those, I was completely dismissive. Um, and then at university, I studied philosophy. Not English literature, I took a few English literature classes, but mostly I studied philosophy, which I found um, 
very stimulating to ask questions like, what is the good? What is beauty? What is justice? Those are really interesting questions. Um, to study, you know, uh, my first course was, of course, in the ancient Greeks, so you study Plato, Aristotle, then you sort of leap through history. But that lineage of human thinking, careful human thinking, careful critical human thinking, is really, really interesting. Even questions like, what is reality? You know, when I close my eyes, you disappear. So isn't reality disappearing? You know, questions of the ego, um, questions of life and death. As an 18, 19 year old, I find those questions really interesting. So I did a philosophy degree. And what I did not realize though at the time was that there's something slightly dangerous about a philosophical approach to life, which is that it emphasizes the logical, the reasonable, the rational. And that's the necessary tool of philosophy. You have to ask critical questions and therefore you have to differentiate between the sensible and the non-sensible, the insensible. It's very empowering, um, but there's a sort of a hidden danger to that, which I didn't discover until years later. Um, my studies of philosophy made me fiercely rational, which is very good in arguments. I remember once, and I'm ashamed of saying this, once I was visiting my grandmother, who was an old school Catholic. Catholicism basically gave her the rhythm of her entire life. Not only gave meaning to her, li to her birth and to her death, but on a weekly basis gave meaning to her life. You know, every Sunday she would go to church. She was familiar not only with religious Catholicism, but cultural Catholicism. All these saints and feasts and all that. It was really what her life was about. Now she was also in some ways, despite being a woman, quite a sexist woman, was very vaguely suspicious of Jews, of course did not tolerate homosexuality, which was a sin. Uh, so I remember once, to my shame, visiting her once, and we started talking about religion. And she, of course, believed in God. And I remember basically shredding her arguments about religion, saying there's no rational basis for religion. You might as well believe in Santa Claus and unicorns and fairies, because really between God and unicorns and fairies, there's no difference. You can't prove any of them. And I remember reducing her to tears, which now I'm ashamed of, because you have to respect people's beliefs. Um, you should criticize them for the negative thoughts, like the homophobia, the sexism, etc. But you should ultimately respect how people are. Anyway, I did not convince her, I only made her sad. So I was, I was as sharp as a lawyer when it came to sort of these kinds of discussions. And then because of my background as a reader, I eventually became a writer. Uh, I became, people sometimes ask me how I became a writer. And the honest answer is I was afraid of the working world. I looked at the working world and I couldn't see any job that I could do. I had a philosophy degree, a four-year philosophy degree. There's no obvious job that demands a four-year degree in philosophy. I, so I looked around saying, maybe I could do this, maybe I could do that, and nothing really spoke to me. So while I was waiting for life to start happening for me in my early 20s, I'm not sure why, maybe an innate creativity, but I, d I couldn't play an instrument, I couldn't dance, I couldn't paint. I didn't know how to write though, because I did go, like all of us, I did go to school. I didn't know how to write English sentences. So to pass the time while waiting for my life to start, I started writing stories, short stories. Because after all, if you're 22 year old and you don't know anything, you're not gonna write a 500 page novel, you're gonna write a five page short story. I started writing short stories and they were all terrible. They were all terrible. But I remember very clearly liking using language on the page, constructing a sentence, sometimes short, sometimes long, playing with subordinate clauses, playing with punctuation. I don't know what kind of punctuation you have in Korean, but I'm sure you have punctuation. But like, we have the semicolon. Do you have sem I think you have semicolon. You know what a semicolon is? Anyone know what a semicolon is? Is there a word for semicolon in Korean? Okay, well, you know, the semicolon is a slightly difficult punctuation mark to use. It's not like a colon, you know, the two little dots. Use those two little dots to announce a list. I need you to buy five things, colon. Eggs, milk, ham, cheese, and, and bread. Use a colon to announce a list. A semicolon marries two sentences that are sort of closely related. Not so related that you need a comma, but so, you know, they're close enough. So it's a tough one to learn how to use. I remember loving thinking about punctuation. 
So I started writing stories, and they're all very bad, but I liked writing them. So I kept on writing bad short stories, and slowly, practice does make, not perfect, but makes you better, slowly they got better. And eventually I had a few uh, 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 short stories published for very little money, but a little money is better than no money, and it's very uh, gratifying, and it's very validating. So I kept on writing, and I slowly got better, and eventually I got published, and eventually I had two books published, a collection of short stories and a first novel, as I said, none of which sold, but in Canada we have a very a good uh, program for subsidizing the arts. At the federal level, it's called the Canada Council for the Arts, and every province has also an arts grant-giving body, and even some cities have uh, grant-giving bodies for artists, because we are nothing without art. We are nothing without culture. Um, so I was lucky to have a few grants, uh, and in fact, it's one of those that I went to, to India. Um, so here I was, I'd written two books, and I was gonna write my third one set in Portugal. Then I got to India, and the great piece of luck of my life was that it was India I went to. Thank God that girl was going to India, and not some other country, not Switzerland, not Paraguay. It was India. Um, so I got there, it, it, it didn't work with the girl, but it worked with the country. The country stayed with me. So I went there a second time, this Portuguese novel time. But suddenly, as I said, I had to put it away. And now I'm looking at this country. And as I said, I am from a fiercely secular, anti-religious background, and I'm in India. And man, there's a lot of religion in India. There's Hinduism, of which there are hundreds of millions, and they're not just the numbers of people, it's the number of temples. It's the way they dress, you know, those dots, those lines on their foreheads, these massive pilgrimages where hundreds of thousands of people participate. Um, there's Islam, of course. It's only a fraction of Indian population, but that still means like 150, 200 million Muslims in India. And then there's Buddhism, Buddhism started in India. There's Jainism, there's uh, Baha'i, there are Christians, of course. They're a tiny minority, but there's still more Christians in India than there are people in Canada. Um, there's Jainism, there's animism. It's all there in front of you. And it's really quite striking, architecturally, in the way people dress. Um, in, in, it's, it's really a remarkable thing. You cannot but notice it in India. And then there's the animals. Now, let me once again go back. I'm a typical Westerner in that I grew up in cities. I grew up um, in Ottawa, in Montreal. In, my parents were diplomats, so I spent 10 years in Paris, uh, one year in Mexico City. Mammoth cities, sort of like Seoul. Now, in my upbringing, the animals we had were strictly under our control. So I grew up, I did have pets. I've noticed a few people here with little animals on their little, you know, their favorite, their little dog on their phone. So I imagine Koreans do have pets. Well, I had pets. I had two dogs over the course of my life. Um, I had a hamster, I had a guinea pig. I had a few little pets like that. Now, were those real animals? Yes, they were real animals. Did I treat them like real animals? Hmm? No, they were toys. They were little playthings. Uh, they were amusements. Did I think of them in terms of their own being? No, I would speak to them. I would speak to them in French or in English. I would play them when I wanted to, and I'd put them away when I didn't want them. Uh, hamsters are nocturnal. Did I respect my hamster's sleeping cycle? No. If I wanted to play with them during the day, I would wake them up, and I would play with my hamster. So they were toy things whose inner being I completely ignored. Now, honestly, am I going to look into the eyes of my little hamster and commune with them? No. But, as I said, it was no more than a play thing. Now, what wild animals did I know growing up? Well, in Montreal, there were squirrels. There were squirrels in the parks. There are squirrels in the parks of Montreal. They're not wildly savage animals, but they are wild animals. You can give them peanuts, they'll come up to you. There are wild animals. There are pigeons. Hardly a fiercely wild animal, but still, there are pigeons in Montreal you see quite routinely. In Saskatoon, where I live now, we regularly see rabbits running around, it's quite surprising. Or they're hares, sorry, they're not rabbits, they're hares. There are two distinct words in Korean for hare and rabbit. Rabbits dig burrows, hares live above ground. Same thing, they have big ears though, very beautiful animals. You will see hares. Um, and of course, you will see hawks in the sky in Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan. 
once again, on the periphery of my existence and definitely subordinate animals. All these animals I might see would step out of my way, would get out of my way. The hares would run away. The hawks would never get close to us. The pigeons, of course, would move away. Same thing with the squirrels. Once again, animals on the periphery, animals that I never thought about. My only real encounter with animals, I would say, growing up, were of two orders. On television, nature documentaries, that's when you see animals as animals. You know, BBC wildlife documentaries in Africa, thrillingly shot, and that's where you meet what the zoo trade calls charismatic megafauna. You know, when you go to a zoo, you see a tiny little fraction of what's out there. You know, there's 4,000 species of bats. Just of bats, there are 4,000 different species. In a zoo, you'll maybe see one or two. You know, mammals are a minority of animals, and the one you see in, in zoos are an even smaller minority. You will see the ones that are really impressive to us. A, a, a zoo will typically have things like elephants, lions, uh, 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 giraffes, um, maybe some buffalo, big animals that are really impressive. You're not gonna have a zoo with 50 different kinds of slugs, because we don't find slugs terribly interesting to look at. They're kind of boring, whereas a lion is very impressive to look at. A panda bear is very interesting to look at, even though that's just a handful of species. Nonetheless, no nature documentaries were the medium in which I first encountered animals. But it is on a flat screen, electronically, necessarily far away. I mean, I would see documentaries about animals in Canada. So the grizzly bear, which is very impressive, black bears, brown bears, you know, uh, a caribou, elk. I would see those, but once again, on a flat screen, and it was one channel among many. If I got bored with a documentary, I would switch channels. Once again, these animals were at my service, and they were mainly being looked at because they were entertaining. As I said, I've never in my life seen a documentary on the slug because the slug is probably not very interesting. The nature documentaries that I always remember were always interesting animals to us, uh, whether it be on the primates like chimpanzees or gorillas, or something very colorful. I remember seeing one once on parrots. I've always liked parrots. Parrots are amazing looking animals. It was a documentary on macaws, the biggest kinds of parrots, the ones you see in South America. So that was my encounter, or zoos. Those were the two, but there aren't that many zoos. They're only in big cities. Those are my two encounters with animals. And what I would say of my upbringing in terms of animals is animals were subservient and peripheral. They were not at all central. They were mostly for entertainment or for food. You either look at an animal because it's pretty for five minutes, then you get bored, or you eat it. We eat our cows and our pigs uh, and our chickens and those we never know about their existence. It's one thing I, I, I wouldn't know here, but sometimes when I uh, speak about animals in Canada, I'll ask people in their city, you know where City Hall is, you know where your hospitals are, um, you know where your police stations are, you know where your schools are and your universities, do you know where your, your, your slaughterhouse is? And most people have no idea where their slaughterhouse is. So for example, does anyone here know where a slaughterhouse is in Seoul? Does anyone know? Raise their hands if they know where there's a slaughterhouse in Seoul. You eat meat every day, right? You eat pork here, you eat chicken, you eat, well, you don't slaughter a fish, but most, and the reason for that is most slaughterhouses are hidden away. They don't advertise themselves. If you go to a slaughterhouse, it's a horrific, a horrific experience. You have animal after animal treated in an industrialized, mechanized form and slaughtered in a way that is really horrific. To us now, maybe in ancient times when we were still hunters and gatherers, when we still hunted, we wouldn't be so shocked. But to see cow after cow after cow shot in the head with a bolt, and then a metal bar sweeping under its feet so it falls on its side so it can be hoisted up, and then it can start being slaughtered. To see that not done once, but you know, hundreds of times in a completely mechanized fashion is really shocking to people who no longer live close to animals. We're used to our meat being in supermarkets, nicely packaged, the animal kind of removed. Now it's no longer an animal, it's just protein, nicely packaged. So most slaughterhouses are hidden, and whereas you could always 
of course, go to a museum. They encourage you to go to a museum. And you might even go to your main police station and say, could I visit this with my class? I'd like to see how this police station operates. They might let you. You try to visit a slaughterhouse. You try to organize a visit to a slaughterhouse. They're going to say, no, thank you. You can't come in. They don't want you to see what they do because it is shocking. So I would say animals were either entertainment or food coming from hidden sources that would just appear in the supermarket or in the markets here. Um, so I never really thought of animals particularly, certainly less so than I thought of myself and my fellow human beings. I came out of my studies of philosophy very focused on the human, because we're really sharp animals, we're really smart animals. And then I arrive in India. I arrive in India and suddenly I have nothing to do but to be in India. And I already said I noticed religion. The other thing I noticed were animals. Now, when I say I noticed animals, it's first of all a literal comment. India, of course, is a tropical country. Canada is a temperate country. In, anim in Canada, you very rarely see truly wild animals. You're very rarely into close contact with animals. When I was younger, when I was a young man, I was a tree planter in northern Ontario. And there once I remember seeing a bear, a real bear, and I was scared. It was really scary. Um, but that's about as close as I, as I, would, I, I would come to it. Um, in India, you see animals everywhere. It is, you, you see rats, you see lizards, uh, you see insects, you see birds, you see monkeys. And monkeys are very clever animals. They're all over the place. They're sometimes scary. They, I remember once care having, I was with a girlfriend, uh, uh, um, this was the first time, and she had a bag of bananas. And monkeys came up to her, and they grabbed that bag of bananas. And it was scary. They were very, very uh, 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 brash animals coming right up to us. But you see them in temples all over the place. You see elephants. So not only do you see animals in a literal way, but just as interesting to me, you see them in a metaphorical way, especially with Hinduism. Hinduism is full of animals. Um, so for example, uh, those of you who maybe little know about Hinduism, uh, one of the Hindu gods is Ganesh. Ganesh has the head of an elephant. Every god in Hinduism has an animal transporter, an animal that will transport him. So Shiva has Nandi. Nandi is a bull. Ganesh has a rat. So in front of any Hindu temple, to this or that god, there will be a sculpture of that animal transporter. So in front of every Shiva temple, there will be a, 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 a sculpture of Nandi the bull. And by tradition, if a woman touches the testicles of Nandi the bull, it will help her fertility. So the testicles of Nandi the bull are always super shiny <laughs> from millions of women rubbing their testicles. Um, so you see these animals, they're there. And also, I remember in, in a number of temples in the south of India, you see that less so in the north of India. In the south of India, you will see elephants in temples. And you'll give them a few coins, and they'll sort of gently bonk you on the head. And that'll be a blessing. So you see elephants in temples. So I was suddenly seeing all these animals, and then all these religions. And the result of that was I was intrigued. Here I was, fiercely anti-religious, and I stopped for a moment there saying, okay, I'm fiercely anti-religious, but right here I'm in India, and I'm not a Hindu, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Buddhist, so I have no reason particularly to be angry at these religions. They've done nothing to me personally. Um, so why don't I just observe a bit? And the result of that was a very simple question that changed my life which was, why are these people here? And by that I mean, why are these people here in a temple or a mosque or a church or a synagogue? Why are they here? This was in the late, um, this was in 1999, 2000. So it were 2000 years you know, after Jesus Christ and we have computers, we have airplanes, we have vaccination, we have scientific bureaucracy, you know, bureaucracy that have yielded the modern state. We have all these things, and yet we still have people in these places called mosques, churches, and, and synagogues, and, and temples, who are still praying to gods. And for the first time, I asked myself, why are they doing this? Why are they still here? How come they have not left that all behind and become, you know, secular citizens? Very arrogant point of view. But I asked myself this, why are they here? And I figured it, it can't be 
all the negative things of organized religion. It's not just about men trying to remain in power. It's got to be something else. Because most of the people I would see in these temples and mosques and churches, seeing a, a, a backpacker in India, in the south of India there are fewer tourists in the north, and India is so vast with so many people that the Western backpacker is still a tiny little minority phenomenon eliciting quite a lot of curiosity. So any number of mosques and temples I'd go into, people would come up to me and say, oh, where are you from? Oh, you're from Canada. I would like Canada. Da, 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 da. And they'd give me their little spiel about Canada. Is it very cold in Canada? Yes, it's very cold in Canada. The little stereotypical conversation, but they'd be very gentle and curious. And so I asked myself for the first time, why are these people here? And for the first time in my life, it was a genuine question. I figured it can't just be the trappings of organized religion. It must be something else. And so every book that I've written has been an attempt to understand something. So my first book, a collection of short stories, which is now published with Life of Pi, a collection of short stories called The Facts Behind the Helsinki Rock Matios. In that one, I was just trying to understand how stories work, what are stories about, how can you tell stories. It was sort of a self-consciously literary book trying to ask myself, what can stories do? That's especially most obvious in the title story, The Facts Behind the Helsinki Rock Matios, which is more a novella. Then in the second one, Self, it's the story of a boy who, while backpacking in Portugal, um, metamorphosizes into a woman. On the day of his birthday, 18, he just transforms into a woman. And he, she, is a woman for seven years. And then she turns once again into a man. Sort of like Orlando. If anyone of you have heard of Orlando by Virginia Woolf, it's kind of the same premise, but hers is very different. The person is a woman for 400 years. She's immortal. Um, Mine was a secular version of that. Uh, um, so it played on gender identity. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be gay? What does it mean to be straight? I was just curious about that because I realized growing up as a boy that I grew up in a very sexist environment and I didn't like that. So I said, well, how can I stop being sexist? Best way would be to become a woman. If I'm a woman for seven years, I will understand sexism. So I couldn't do that literally. I didn't want to. I did that imaginatively by writing a story where I became a woman. For, for the duration of that story. So there I was questioning that question. And Life of Pi, I wrote because I became interested in this notion of religion. What does it mean to have faith? That's, what the, that's the key thing in Life of Pi that I'm investigated. I have no interest in organized religion, but faith remains a fascinating phenomenon. Faith, why people believe in gods, which they cannot prove. You know, uh, it's interesting if you look at the history of philosophy, um, Descartes, René Descartes, the French philosopher, has these famous meditations uh, in which he seeks to prove the existence of God. Now, what a curious thing to do in the 17th century. People have been believing in Christ. This is a Catholic society. have been believing in Christ for 1,700 years. Why do you suddenly need to prove the existence of God? Everyone believes in God anyway. So why was Descartes trying to prove the existence of God? Why? Because rationality was discovered. In the Enlightenment, they discovered rationality. They discovered that if we think a bit more carefully and get rid of superstition and think very carefully, really amazing things can happen. Mathematics, uh, you know, F equals MA, one of the formulas of Newton. Uh, more contemporarily, E equals MC square. You know, all these things come from the result of close attention to detail. So rationality was discovered. And it was kind of like discovering a computer today. Hey, whoa, this is a really powerful thing, the computer. We can do things with it. So one of the things that the philosophers of the Enlightenment decided to do is, hey, we have this wonderful thing called rationality. Let's prove what we already know exists, which is God. Let's prove the existence of God through this new tool called rationality to make us even stronger believers than we already are. Now, what's interesting about Descartes' meditation is none of them work. None of the Descartes' meditations work. Now, sorry if I bore you, those who already are familiar with them, but like, for example, one of the proofs that uh, uh, Descartes mentions is the one that goes along the lines of this. By definition, a god is perfect, right? It'd be sort of funny to think of a god who is not perfect. A god is perfect, and which is more perfect, the god who exists or the god who does not exist? Well, obviously the God who exists. Lack of being it must surely be a sign of imperfection. Therefore, by definition, since gods are perfect, they must exist. 
That's one of them. Another one is the one, let's say you're walking along a street and you find a watch. If you find a watch, there must necessarily be a watchmaker. Otherwise, how would this watch come into existence? Well, if you look at nature, there is order. So, for example, you do know this because it snows here in winter, right? Snowflakes. Every single snowflake has five points. Or is it six? Anyway, let's say it's five. It's whenever, whatever it is. Every single snowflake, if you looked under a microscope, every single snowflake has five points. Not two, not four, not eight, five. They all look different, it's like a fingerprint, but every single one has five points. So the, the philosopher of the Enlightenment said, well, if there's order in nature, there must be someone who created that order. And who could that be but God? Therefore, God exists. He has many proofs like that. And what's funny is none of those work. And in fact, it's one of the basic things you do, in, and certainly in the West, when you start studying philosophy, is one of the first things you do is you read Descartes' meditations, because they're very short. They're short and brilliant. And it's your first exercise as a philosophy student to demolish those proofs, to show what they don't work. They do not work. And that, of course, makes sense. Because if you could rationally prove the existence of God, we would all be so devoted, right? We would all be really, really devoted Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, whatever. Because if something can be proven rationally, it doesn't make sense not to believe it. But the question of belief has always remained a very complicated one. And there are some people who believe, but there's a lot of people who don't, and there's a lot of people in between who kind of sit on the fence and are not sure. Clearly, it's not a rational thing, and that's the way it should be, too. Now, this links back to us being animals. So, when I got to India, I suddenly became interested in the question of faith. Because I knew already from my studies of philosophy, you cannot prove it rationally. It is an irrational or certainly non-rational phenomenon. Yet it is one that is shared by hundreds of millions of people. Um, maybe possibly even billions of people. So why is that? And so I got to India and I decided, well, the only way I can investigate that is by being it. So I created Pi, Pi Patel, and I said to myself, Pi will be religious. Now, I, don't, I didn't want him to practice only one religion because I was afraid if you practice only one religion, don't forget I come from Quebec, a fiercely secular, anti-religious province. If Pi was, as he statistically should be, was a Hindu, nothing wrong with that, but as a Canadian writer writing a Canadian novel meant for Canadian readers, Hinduism is so exotic, is so far away, slightly folkloric because it's so colorful. I was afraid most Canadian readers would say, huh, I don't know anything about Hinduism, I'm not interested. And as a writer, you don't want to start with something that is inherently not interesting. Then I thought, well, if I make him Muslim, and Islam is somewhat better known in, in Canada, then my fear is that Islam has a reputational problem in parts of the West because of its kidnapping by terrorists. And so it generally has not a terribly good reputation. So if I have my character say, Allah Wakbar, likely my average novel reader in Toronto would think that next thing he was going to blow himself up or do some terrorist act. Um, so the peaceable Muslim is, you know, certainly can be constructed, but once again, it's slightly a bit of a challenge. And um, if he were Christian, that certainly would not work. Where I come from, a character says, Jesus says, immediately has the room emptying. We're not interested in what Jesus says, because usually it'll be some American evangelical fanatic who's saying some nonsense about gays or abortion or some craziness that, you know, is typical of American evangelical crazies. So I could not have Pi saying, Jesus says. So what could I do with that? I so, said, well, I have an idea. Since I'm not really talking about organized religion, I actually want to talk about faith. And every single religion, that's the one element it shares. Every religion is very different in the way it presents, in the way it's practiced. In fact, it's quite lovely doing comparative religion because you see how they have a different, it's not a question of different strengths and weaknesses, but just different characteristics. So I said, I'll have pride practice three. The three main religions you can find in, in, in India, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity. Um, uh, I couldn't have him be a Jew because you cannot be a, a Christian and a Jew at the same time, because the Jew is waiting for the Messiah on Saturday, and then the Christian celebrates the Messiah on the Sunday. So you can only do that for a week. 
You either have the Messiah or you don't. So he couldn't be a Jew. But I had him be a Muslim and a Christian and a Hindu. Because then I could relativize organized religion and focus on what I was really interested in, which was faith. That phenomenon whereby we believe in things for which we have no proof. Which to me was a great discovery. Naive and foolish and arrogant and stupid as I was. To me this notion that, hey, faith is, you know, unprovable. And hey, it's kind of important. I had not realized that. I belatedly realized that, in fact, it's the main motor of the human creature. We all operate using faith. And rationality is a late discovery. Children are irrational. They're full of faith. They have faith in their parents. They have faith in their toys. They have faith in their puppies. They have faith in a lot of things. Rationality is kind of slow to come. And then eventually it comes, and it's a very useful tool. That's my point in, in Life of Pi, in fact, is rationality is a wonderful tool, but it is only a tool. You are not your cell phone. Despite your love of your cell phones in this country, you are not your cell phone. It is just a tool. Just as a computer is just a tool, an airplane is just a tool, a tool is only useful if you know why you're using it. If I pick up a screwdriver or a hammer, I presumably pick it up only because I need it to either turn a screw or bang in a nail. If I don't have a screw to turn or a nail to bang, why would I pick up that tool? You only pick up a tool once you have a purpose for it. And that purpose comes from some sort of faith. Not religious faith. I only looked at religious faith because it's the most bold, the craziest, the most outlandish, outlandish, the most imaginative kind of faith. But we all of us have faiths, whether it's romantic faith. We love people. We love our parents. We love our children. We love our boyfriends and girlfriends. We love our pets. We love our toys. We love our tools. We love, 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 love. Love is all an act of faith. Animals don't have love. They have fidelity. They have loyalty, but they don't have love. Love is a very human characteristic, and it makes no sense. So animals, uh, you know, some mate for life, but most just mate when it comes time to mate, and it's a very sort of shocking, scary thing, and then they immediately separate. So, for example, tigers are solitary creatures. Once a year they mate, and then the male goes off and the female goes off, and they don't meet up again, because likely the male will eat the cubs. So they mate briefly, and then they stay entirely solitary. Um, so, in the animal world, it mostly makes no difference who you're going to mate with. Preferably someone that looks like they're going to last. So you don't want to mate with a weak creature. You want to mate with a stronger one. But beyond that, personality, appearance does not matter. It's not the handsome rooster doesn't just mate with the handsome chicken, the beautiful chicken. They just mate to survive. We are the only ones who mate usually with people we love. And that makes no real sense, because frankly, in terms of reproduction, it doesn't matter that you find your husband or your wife handsome or beautiful. It really doesn't matter. Unless they're sterile, they will ensure the continuity of the species. Um, so that faith we all have. And we have other kinds of faiths. Political faiths, faiths in political parties, faiths in sports teams, frivolous faiths, like faith in sports teams. These are all faiths that we have that are completely unnecessary from a rational perspective, but absolutely essential to who we are as human beings. No one can do without any kind of faith, because that basically would deny your entire being. You want to have faith. And the point to realize is that once you have your faith, once you're aware of your faith, then you can make better use of your tools. So, perfect example would be theology. Um, in writing Life of Pi, I read many wonderful works of uh, theology, enlightened ones. And there what you have are theologians who have faith and now use rationality to hone their understanding of what their faith is. And that can be very useful. I'll give you one um, uh, very brief example. Um, the language of the Bible, if you remember... Jesus tells all kinds of parables. There are all kinds of stories to do with Jesus. Interesting how religion always uses stories where science doesn't. Religion uses stories to make its message. So Jesus constantly is telling parables and there's constantly stories about um, Jesus. So one of them, if you remember, is uh, uh, the, the disciples and Jesus are in a boat and a storm comes and they are terrified. And then they see Jesus walking on water. And he says to the disciples, why are you so scared? I'm here. 
I am here. You don't have to be scared. And if you remember, there's in one of the uh, uh, Gospels, Peter says, Lord, can I come and see you? And then Jesus says, yes, come. So Jesus steps out of the boat onto the water and approaches Jesus. But then he suddenly starts sinking. And Jesus grabs him by the hand and brings him back to the boat. Now, for centuries, people took that completely literally. They think that Jesus had some quite splendid capacity to walk on water. Kind of useful, I suppose, if you're in a rush to cross a river. You don't have to take the bridge. You can run across the water. It was kind of this magical special effect. Kind of made Jesus superhuman uh, somehow. It was a very literal. Now, if you take it literal, literally, it's not at all useful. That Jesus could walk on water, what does that do to you? What does that teach you? Absolutely nothing. You only get to that meaning if you use your rationality, if you start thinking carefully, if you use that little tool to understand. The idea of that is that if you think of it, at that time, no one knew how to swim. Swimming is a modern invention. For centuries and centuries and centuries, no one knew how to swim. It's a modern invention. So in the ancient world, deep water was terrifying water. Anyone who was in water beyond their height was going to drown. Maybe the odd person spontaneously developed some sort of rudimentary swimming technique, but the vast majority of people, once they were in deep water, were fated to drown. And deep water is also dark water. Where light does not go very deep into water. So in that parable, in that story of Jesus on water, it's nothing about you know, Hollywood special effects. It's all an allegory on purity. Jesus is sinless, so he is a top water. We who are sinners cannot be on water, and we sink. And the reason that Peter sinks is because he's mortal. He's sinful. So initially, in, ha in his faith with Jesus, he stands on water, but then he starts sinking. So it's an allegory on purity and sin. The human will sink into dark water because we are sinful. Jesus is pure. He floats atop the water where the light is. So it's, it's, a, it's an allegory on purity and sin and salvation. That only comes to light if you think rationally, if you use the tools of rationality. So rationality only makes sense once you know how to use it properly. So here I was in India. I wanted to look at faith, and I have Pi practice three religions, not because I'm interested in three organized religions, because I'm interested in faith, that phenomenon that we all need to have. And so I created this story, and this is where I'm going to ruin it for those who haven't read it. If you read the book or even seen the movie, you will know it's a shipwreck story of someone who crosses the Pacific, and he's in a lifeboat with an animal. In fact, initially with four animals, but very quickly he's in a lifeboat with one animal. So Pi is with Richard Parker, a tiger, and he's on that boat for 227 days as he crosses the Pacific before reaching the coast of Mexico. That is both simply an adventure story, which people took to, and I was very grateful that they took to it. But to me, the lifeboat is a metaphor on who we are as human beings. In that boat, you have a wild animal, and in the story, he is treated throughout like a wild animal. He's never anthropomorphized. He never becomes Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. He never starts speaking English. Or at one point, he does speak English, Pi thinks, but it's a, it's, it's a mistake. It's a French cook who speaks English with a French accent. Um, the tiger never speaks. The tiger remains a wild animal, a fiercely dangerous wild animal. On that same boat, you have a religious being. To my mind, the lifeboat is a metaphor on who we are as creatures. We unite the divine and the animal. We are animals, absolutely descended from the, we are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, it's incontrovertible that we are descended. We are, are, you know, chimpanzees are our distant cousins. We are all descended from the same soup from which one little amoeba popped into existence and started evolving. We are animal creatures. We share this planet with animals. There's a great distance between us and slugs. But, you know, the genetic difference between us and uh, chimpanzees and gorillas is minimal. It's a fraction of a percent of genetic difference. Of course, that slight difference is key. But nonetheless, the vast majority of our genetic material is shared not only with chimpanzees and gorillas uh, and orangutans and the other and... and, and um, um, 
what's the other higher primate anyway, uh, but also shared to decreasing number with all other animals. We share, we are animals, but at the same time, we have a capacity to go much further than any animal can in conceiving and looking at the great universe. Animals have no religion. Animals have far less than we do. We strangely, bizarrely, have gone way beyond animals to conceive of something beyond us, the divine. So in that lifeboat with Pi and the, and, the, and, the, and the tiger, to me, that is exactly who we are. Each of you is a lifeboat, and your life is a kind of Pacific that you are crossing. And you're hoping to reach the coast of Mexico. You're hoping for some kind of understanding, some kind of salvation. Um, but you will get there only if you, like Pi, show that mixture of faith and rationality. I, when I, by the time I got to India, and that's why I was so glad that I got there, is I was drying up. That I was disinterested in religion was not a problem with me. But my rationality was trying to dry up even my appreciation of the arts. Because after all, the arts also require an act of faith. Um, when you start a novel, you know, the, the expression that is used in, in, in Canada, in the English-speaking world, is suspension of disbelief. When you start a novel, when you start reading Harry Potter, you have to suspend your disbelief. You have to believe that there's a wizardry school called, uh, called uh, um, Hogwarts. God, how could I forget that? Uh, you have to believe that there's a wizardry school called Hogwarts. You have to believe that there's station nine and a half, nine and three quarters. If you don't believe that, then you, you stop reading, right? As soon as a novel becomes unconvincing, as soon as you don't believe something, you lose interest. You have to what's called suspend your disbelief. Now, what is suspension of disbelief but the literary equivalent of having faith in religion? God's religions only work if you suspend your disbelief. If you go to a, a Catholic or a Christian church and you see this sculpture and someone starts talking about Jesus, the first step for it becoming meaningful to you is you suspending your disbelief, you making some what's called in English a leap of faith, a jump, a leap of faith. Um, if you don't, then it, the religion doesn't work to you. So most secular people, if someone starts telling them about Buddha or about Allah, if they don't make the leap of faith, it's just anthropology. It's just some colorful folkloric practice practiced by other people, and it's only culturally, historically, maybe architecturally interesting. It is not personally interesting because they don't make they don't suspend their disbelief. Suspension of disbelief and a leap of faith are synonymous terms. In one you believe in art, in the other you believe in gods. There's a close similarity to the two. Now my rationality had completely stunted any kind of religious thinking, but it was also starting to contaminate my appreciation of the arts, which was manifesting not so much in painting and in music, but in reading. I was getting less and less patient with the reading of novels and of fiction. I was getting irked more quickly, annoyed at the ploys, at the, the you know, overly beautiful language. It's a temptation to write sentences that are overly beautiful, because they are beautiful, but they can also be hollow. Beauty, beauty in itself has no substance, it's just an appearance. So I was getting quite irked by books, and I'm a writer. If you're a writer who is irked by books, what is your future? So my rationality was kind of tainting everything. And then I got to India. And so I started writing Life of Pi, and initially just slightly coolly, I said, I will investigate faith, because I'm suddenly interested in this thing. Because frankly, Indian temples are so beautiful. They're so vast. There's something uh, really fascinating. I mean, churches can be interesting too, and, and, uh, but there's something about Hinduism. In Hinduism, you have something called the Murti, and the Murti is what to Western and Presto Korean looks like a little doll. It's a little doll. But in fact, it's the divine incarnated. It's the divine spirit of a god in a little doll. And just as if you have a guest come to your house, you would feed that guest. You would say, this is the bathroom if you need the bathroom. This is your bed where you will sleep. The murti is taken care of. It is fed, it is bathed, it is dressed, it is given food. And the murti is at the very, very center of a temple. And it's very funny, in Hinduism, I remember I was saying how religions are, have different characteristics. One thing that I love in Hinduism is something called darshan. What darshan is, 
there's something very visual about Hinduism. Uh, it is a very colorful, spectacular religion. There's thousands of gods. They have their sculptures, their temples, and it's architecturally right in your face. A lot of sculptures. It's the it's the polar opposite of Islam, which is extremely sober. Uh, you know, uh, Hinduism is a comic strip, is a manga comic strip to the nth degree compared to Islam. It's very, very colorful, and it's literally very visual when it comes to darshan. What darshan is, and Hindus will line up during festivals for hours to have darshan. Darshan is that moment when you have visual contact with the Murti. So you will line up for hours. And these temples are vast, and they, they're very well organized in dealing with crowds in India, because they are so crowded, frankly. But you have lineups that will go on the outside wall of the temple, and then on the inside wall, then the next wall, then the next wall, and the next wall, and the next wall. And you finally get to get Darshan, which can last only a few seconds, maybe. But you are finally looking at the Murti. You are finally having a visual contact with God. And for Hindus, that's a very powerful moment. It's culturally acquired, of course. To a Westerner, you're just looking at a little G.I. Joe doll kind of dressed up. And, you know. But if you are brought up in the Hindu way, that moment is very, very important. And what that means, though, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a tropical country is by the time you waited for hours and you're initially outside in the sunlight, by the time you get inside the temple, this vast stone temple, and you see the Murti, and they explicitly say like that, the Murti, inside the, when you get to the Murti, you're basically looking at the womb of the universe. You're looking at the womb that creates the universe. Just as the womb creates babies, it creates the universe. And there is a sort of a moist intimacy that's really powerfully sensual, and it's incredibly intoxicating when you, you, you get to see that moment of darshan. Um, so that's what I wanted to investigate, is, is how do you get that? So when I wrote Life of Pi, I started, whereas before I would avoid religious houses, except for maybe the ones that are architecturally famous, very briefly looking at that. Now, I, on the contrary, I went totally the other way, and I started visiting every single temple I could see, uh, churches, mosques, and I wasn't there looking for what I hated. It's very easy to find what you hate about religions. That's a very standard Western feature, necessary, I mean, still today, the Catholic Church is doing, I mean, any number of terrible things. Um, but there's more to it than that. So when I went into these God houses, I call them in the novel, I was not looking for that. I was looking for the divine. I was trying to see these people and saying, what are they here for? Let me follow them. Let me try to understand them. Let me be like them. And what's wonderful about fiction is fiction can become truth. Because after all, and that's another point I make in Life of Pi, is life just isn't the facts that surround us. Life is an interpretation. Life is what you make of it. Hence the importance of faith. Hence the importance of the imagination. Life isn't just the flat facts of our existence. When you were born, who your parents are, where you happen to live, what language you happen to speak. Those are basically non-facts. They're, they're so banal. What is interesting is the, what happens after those facts are, are taken into account. In a sense, facts are like the ground. And what's interesting is what you build on that ground. Life is architecture. Life isn't the ground. Life is the architecture of what you build on that ground. And that is entirely up to interpretation. So for example, even tonight here, we're all in this same room. You're all listening to me. Some of you are maybe riveted. You really find this interesting. Some of you are maybe completely bored. It is so banal what he's saying. He is so pretentious. I cannot wait to get out of here. I'm just being polite. Same event, same words, same moment, radically different interpretations. What's the difference is you're bringing something different to it. Some of you are maybe bringing openness. Some of you like Life of Pi, so you're open-minded. Those of you who haven't read Life of Pi are finding me completely boring. As I said, same event, different interpretation. That's up to you. This moment right here is a co-creation. I don't know if you can translate that into Korean, a co-creation. Like they're co-directors, it's a co-creation. It's created by the two of us. Sure, I'm saying things but you're the ones who are interpreting it. And depending on how you interpret it, you'll get more or less out of it. And that's entirely how life is. You know, I'll go to a Korean, yet another Korean meal, and yet eat more Korean food, and I may be getting a little bit tired, maybe I'd like to have a hamburger, while you are loving your Korean food, because you love Korean food, because you're Koreans. Same food, same people, but different interpretations. All of life is like that. Life is an interpretation. The facts play a minimal role in how you interpret life. Hence why there's some people who have terribly hard lives but seem incredibly happy. And some people have lives of unbelievable privilege 
and are miserable human beings. Those material facts of wealth and poverty and luck and education, of course they play a factor, but even more so is what you make of them. And for that, as I said, you need a certain sense of faith, a sense of the imagination. And I put those in parallel because both need each other. You cannot have faith without the imagination, and a good use of the imagination instills you with a kind of faith. Um, hence, as I said earlier, and I said it twice now, it's interesting how religion always uses stories. All religions tell stories. That's explicit in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You see that in Islam. You see that in stories of Buddha. Stories are told by religion. And that said, that's not an obvious thing. As I said, science has anecdotes. You know, the apple falling on, falling on, on Newton's head. You know, the idea that Einstein wasn't very good at school. We have all these little you know, anecdotes about science, how Francis Crick and James Watts came up with the DNA, you know, the double helix. But those are inessential. Those are not at all important to the conclusions of science. The conclusions of science are not narrative. They're certainly historical, but they are not inherently narrative. They are formulas that are true whether we're there or not. They are not narrative. Every religion I can think of tells stories. And it's interesting, if you are moved by great art, and I imagine all of you in this room have been moved by great art, there is something otherworldly about great art. You read a great novel, you see a big, beautiful painting, you hear music, and it moves you beyond the rational. It moves you into this other state. It gives you the sense of exaltation. Um, and so religion uses art. Art gives you a sense of the religious, of the divine. Um, they need each other. And so when I was writing Life of Pi, what happened is I became transformed by what I was looking at. So I still have no tolerance for uh, organized religion, particularly. You know, it's sometimes convenient. It gives you a place to pray if you want to pray. It gives you certain rules that are, uh, that are useful, you know, the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, but otherwise, I, I stay away from it. But the idea of the divine, it's not a question of believing dogma but it's a question of staying in conversation with that possibility. Because as I said, we are not computers. Rationality has its limits. And I'll give you an obvious example of the limits of rationality. If I played a great symphony, if I played Beethoven, and I asked you, is this true? Which is a very rational question. It wouldn't make sense to you. Is it true? If I showed you a great painting, is it a true painting? You'd be sort of puzzled. Because obviously that rational question is not correct when it comes to a beautiful painting or to beautiful art. And in a sense, that same, you must realize the limits of rationality. If you don't, then I think ultimately you become insane. There's no triumph in a human being who is rational his or her entire life. If you're 98 years old and you're dying and you say to yourself, I have been rational my entire life. I've never done something irrational. That would be a very sad life. That would mean as a child you didn't believe in Santa Claus. You certainly didn't believe in any gods. You would likely not read fiction stories because they're not true. They're just fantasies. Hogwarts does not exist. Um, so why would you waste yourself reading fiction? There's, why would you fall in love? Likely it'll end up in divorce, right? In most cases. Or you'll certainly be miserable with your husband and your wife because we all become miserable with our husbands and wives. And why would you have children? Children will necessarily disappoint you. Children are always disappointing and you can't control them. There's so many things that you would not do that define us as human beings. There is no triumph in being rational. You don't want to be irrational. You don't want to be crazy. Crazies are not good. But you want to put reason to good use, to proper use. And that means you need to have a clear sense of your faith of whatever faith. It doesn't have to be religious. I'm not proselytizing here in any way. You don't have to be religious if you don't want to. But whatever your faith is, you have to work on that faith. So whether it's your husband or your wife or your children or your guinea pig or your sports team or your favorite boxer or BTS, whatever, if you have faith in them, you've got to work on that faith so that it is a faith that satisfies you, that doesn't disappoint you. Because one of the amazing things of faith, unlike rationality, is it tends to be self-reinforcing. Whereas rationality is not. The saddest thing is a secular person who is confronted with death. Because in the secular world, yes, we write our beautiful novels and we compose our beautiful symphonies and we paint our beautiful paintings, but those all remain intramural. They all remain within the walls of mortality. 
Art is wonderful at describing the here and the now, the life as it is. But once art is confronted with cancer or with a bullet, it has basically nothing to say. The secular person confronted with death is a terribly sad person. Not necessarily a, a person lacking in truth, but they are overwhelmed by sadness. The wearing down of life caused by old age and disease and abandonment is a terrible sadness to which rationality has nothing to say. Other than to say, well, yes, existence is ephemeral, and after that it's all black. And it sucks to be human. Basically, you will die, and it's terrible. That's it. Be escapist. You know, try to stay young forever. Listen to music. Dress too young. Have Botox. Try to stay young because you don't. You want to avoid death. That's basically what the secular world does. What's interesting, and not necessarily true, but what's interesting about the religious world, is it says, "Oh, death is just a threshold. Death is just a border, and you can cross that border. And there's many things that are on the other side. And let's talk about it. And and suddenly, death is just." A, something that's a passage and it completely changes the conversation on life and death not that it diminishes suffering that's another thing interesting that i found is that religious people suffer just as much as secular people but they interpret once again it all comes down to interpretation they interpret their suffering differently and in a way that's self-reinforcing so whereas the rational person and strongly rational people tend to be in my experience you know healthy and wealthy and no more than middle-aged because that's when rationality is at its most powerful when you're young healthy and wealthy when you're young healthy and wealthy you're basically immortal and rationality is like a ferrari it's really powerful but once those things start going hmm, it's harder to believe in that and then you become bitter what's interesting about faith all faiths tend to be self-reinforcing so it's interesting if you look at religious people if something good happens to them, whether it's winning the lottery or not being run over by a bus when they step over the, off the curb, they say, oh, good, Allah saved me. Thank, praise be to Allah. But if they do get hit by the bus, if they do get hit by the bus, they said, oh, well, I got hit by a bus, but Allah will take care of me. Allah must have meant this to happen. Uh, this must have some reason. And I'll give you one of the things that started me on Life of Pi. This is an example of faith being self-reinforcing. In Canada, in British Columbia, on the West Coast, um, there's a terrible, terrible story of a young woman named Rena Verk. Rena Verk was a young woman who was essentially killed by her friends. Her friends beat her and then drowned her. And what was a shock to Canada was that the lead killer was a girl. Rena Verk was very young. I forgot. I think she was 16 or 17. She was a teenager. And the, 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 the main culprit was this other young woman. And another girl was sort of involved, and a boy was also involved, but the boy was peripheral. And this idea of women being that violent was a shock to Canadian society. And so here was this young woman who was murdered. Her body was found in water. And what that was shocking, but you know, we've been there before with acts of violence. What really astounded me is two years, uh, two days after her body was discovered, her parents put out um, a press release it came out in the press and they said, we forgive her killers. We forgive her killers. And when I read that, I said, wow. What parent could say two days after their young daughter's been discovered dead and drowned, could say, we forgive her killers? How could anyone say that? Well, it came out. However, my thought was any belief system that can make you say two days after the discovery of your dead daughter's body, I forgive the killers, has got to have something going for it. Because your average secular person would be completely destroyed by the death of their daughter. Your average rational person, if their daughter was discovered dead, that would be the end of a good chunk of their life. They would be mourning for the rest of their lives. If my daughter were killed, it would completely destroy me. Because rationality has nothing to say about dead daughters. It just says, yep, she died. She died by drowning. Water went to her airways. They can rationally explain how she died but it can give no explanation as to its meaning. Only religion can do that in a way, religion can do that in a way that far surpasses any other belief system. So this family, the Verks, in their mind, obviously God was in a rush to have Rena next to him or her, and therefore Rena now is in a better place, 
Rena will no longer suffer, and they will eventually meet her again. Now, if you can believe that, then sure, I imagine you could forgive her killers, because in fact, her killers were just agents of God. God needed Rena, he needs her to come to him quickly. Here, I'll, hire, I'll get these two people to drown her, and there we go. Rena will be next to me, God the Father. Um, that's clearly how they were thinking. And as I said, you could dismiss that as a delusion, but why would you? Why do you want to take on that appalling weight of sadness at the death of your daughter if you can have a, a mechanism that somehow makes it palatable? So that's the amazing thing about uh, faith thinking, is that it tends to be self-reinforcing. Just as if you properly love your husband or your wife, and you're not too annoyed by them that day, whatever they do reinforces your love for them. Yes, they fail, but they do love you, and they're still there, and so proper faith is self-reinforcing, which rationality is not. Um, so while I was writing Life of Pi, I, in a sense, became Pi, and became imbued with that thinking. And it's wholly transformed my way of thinking about the divine. Not that, as I said, do I believe in dogmas, but the idea of religious thinking, the idea of being in dialogue with the divine, is one I do all the time, simply because I recognize the limits of rationality. I am partly a computer. I know how to use a computer. Part of my mind can work like a computer, but that's just a tool. I'm something else. And what that something else is, is still a mystery to me, but I'm not worried about that. And so I will use my rationality when it's useful to get up here you know, using the elevator, texting. But essentially, I put all those tools aside, and it's nice to be in dialogue with the possibility that there is more than just the material. To think that there's just this chemical material reality is kind of boring. Whereas this notion of the divine, that there's Shiva and Buddha and Allah and Jesus and all these other gods, somehow, it's so amazingly colorful, why wouldn't I entertain that? So ultimately, my argument with Life of Pi is the same as Pascal's wager. Remember the French philosopher Blaise Pascal? There's Pascal's wager, Pascal's bet. And Pascal's bet is, is very simple, it's simply this, is you might as well be religious in some form, because if you're right, and some of that is true, well, when you die, you'll be rewarded for that. If you're a good Buddhist your whole life, or if you're a good Muslim your whole life, when you die, Allah will reward you. And if you deny it and live the life of a, of a, of a non-believer your entire life, and you die and Allah really does exist, well, then it sucks for you because you're going to be in hell. And if you do live the religious life and it proves not to be true, well, you've led a good life. Because after all, the religious life at its best says, you know, be kind, be loving, don't lie, be good to others. Those are all good things. It makes sense to be good. To be good makes you feel good and is good for the world and it's a satisfying thing. So Pascal's Wager says you might as well believe in case it's true, and if it's not, you'll still live a good life. And in a sense, my, my, my argument with Life of Pi is life is an interpretation, so believe the better story. If, those of you who've read the book, the key question in the novel, if you remember at the end, Pi's on this lifeboat, he gets to the coast of Mexico, these investigators talk to him and they say, what happened? And he ends up telling him two stories, if you remember. One with animals, that takes you know, 150 pages to tell, and they're about to leave. And anyone who suffers, anyone who suffers wants their suffering to be accepted, right? If you talk to a Jew from the Holocaust, you don't, he doesn't want to hear, she doesn't want to hear that, oh, the Holocaust didn't happen. You want your suffering to be accepted by the other. Any woman who's been assaulted wants her assault to be taken seriously. Any woman who's been a victim of an act of violence wants that to be taken into account. You want your suffering to be accepted by others. It helps a little bit. So Pi is told what happened to him. He survived with this terrible animal for 227 days. And the investigators basically are not interested. They just want to find out why this ship sank months ago. So they're about to leave and say, so Pi says, well, you don't like my story, I'll tell you another story. And he tells the story without animals. And at the end of it, as they're about to leave, he asks what is the key question in the novel, which is, which is the better story? He asks him, which is the better story? And the younger investigator, Mr. Chiba, immediately says, oh, the story with animals. And the older investigator, older, wiser, more cynical perhaps, says nothing. But the younger one immediately says, oh, the story with animals. And Pi's reply is, thank you, and so it goes with God. So he's saying, in a sense, he's saying that a life with some kind of God, some kind of the divine, is the better story. Not necessarily the truer story, 
Because in Life of Pi, the only one who's been out there, the only one who can say what happened is Pi. He's the only one. There's no other witness. There's no other proof. And he presents two stories. In neither of them is there any lesser suffering. In both stories, his entire family dies. Everything he knows in his entire life has vanished. Not only the human, but the animal, all the zoo animals, and all his possessions, everything. He's stripped down and left with nothing, like King Lear in the storm. He's left with nothing. And he, so he suffers in both, but he presents two stories. One that is slightly harder to believe, the story with animals is not impossible. After all, there were animals on the ship, and ships carry all kinds of things. Hyundai cars, but perhaps giraffes and animals too. Uh, and there are shipwrecks all the time. And then the other story is more flatly believable. We all can believe that people can get nasty when things get rough. Right? The story without animals, with only the humans, gets nasty very quickly. He presents them with two stories, and he says, which is the better story? And he says, and so it goes with garden. So my argument is a life where you interpret it in a magical way is basically like a life with music. Who would like to live a life of total silence? No one. We all want music. Who would like a life with never visiting a museum or a concert hall? Well, no one. It would be boring. In a sense, religious thinking is kind of like that. And we shouldn't worry too much about the truthfulness of it because we can't prove it. So why waste your time? It's like in Christianity, there's this endless fascination with the Jesus of history. Endless number of people are studying in Palestine, trying to find historical evidence for Jesus. I'm always puzzled by that, because I said, what could that prove in any way? Way more interesting to most people would be the Jesus of faith, if they're interested at all. It would be the Jesus of faith, because the Jesus of history, we're very limited. There's so little evidence about Jesus, so little. There's so little to go on. Better to stick with the Jesus of, his, of faith which is one that pulls on your imagination. And that's the starting point of Christianity. It's not the Jesus of history, but the Jesus of faith. And the same would be with all, all religions. So to link back with the animal in us, what struck me in India when I noticed animals and gods is I didn't realize it until later that I was basically seeing the same thing. Divine, the gods are obviously divine. By definition, they're divine. But I hadn't realized was at the other extreme, those slugs that I've so belittled, all those other animals, they're the same thing. I hadn't noticed until much later how the divine and the animal share characteristics. To, uh, just to give you two characteristics that animals and gods share. One of them is um, the absence of writing. Animals, of course, are illiterate. Have you noticed how gods are illiterate? There's no pictorial tradition of God's writing or reading. Jesus, it's interesting if you look at Jesus, just one example, there's, Jesus never wrote anything down. There's only one story. At one point, if you remember those who know the Bible, at one point Jesus is confronted with the adulterous woman. This woman is cheated. She's cheated, she's been unfaithful. What should we do? Should we stone her? And Jesus is embarrassed. And in the gospel, it's indicated that he scratched on the ground. And you see paintings of like massive paragraphs <laughs> on the ground. It's the only instance of Jesus ever approximating something that might be writing. But after all, he was a working class dude. There's no way he'd be literate. In all likelihood, Jesus was an illiterate Jew. And whatever he absorbed, he absorbed by listening. And to his disciples, he never gave letters. He never gave lectures. He only spoke. He was an oral God. Same thing in Islam. Muhammad, to Muhammad, God didn't hand him the Quran. God dictated it to him, and Muhammad wrote it down. In the Greek myths, in the Greek religion, there's no mention of writing gods. There's, why would the god need to write? Gods have infinite knowledge, perfect recall, total memory. If that's the case, why do you need to write? It's all in your mind. Gods are as illiterate as animals. Animals are as illiterate as gods. They're the other extremes of us. The other one, and this is one that will speak to us, is the complete absence of technology. Animals have no technology. You know, there's some talk of, you know, chimpanzees having, you know, little sticks that they stick into ant hills and ants come to them and they lick the lance out. Otters will put little nuts on them and break them with a, a stone. You know, that is a very, very rudimentary use of technology. But really, animals have no technology. 
And guess what? Gods have no technology. Gods have no technology. There's no sense of gods having any technology because they don't need it. They're omnipotent and omniscient. If they want to appear, they don't need a car. They just appear. They likely just appear in your mind. There's an absence of technology with gods. There's no pictorial tradition of gods having cell phones. Uh, and I'm not glib in this sense. There's no, you know, we have to be familiar with religions. We have to make gods our own. They have to speak to us. Of course, they're beyond us. But for us to understand them, they have to be seen in human terms. You know, hence Greek religion, where the gods were sort of like us writ large. In fact, they were gods writ small. They were gods made small so that we can understand them. All religions, in a sense, shrink themselves. The gods shrink themselves to be understandable to us. So why wouldn't we portray gods with technology? Well, we just don't, because there's no sense that they need it. You know, there's no sense that any god would need a hearing aid, because gods would necessarily have perfect hearing. I can't imagine a picture of God, of Jesus, wearing glasses. Have you ever seen a picture of God wearing glasses? No. Does Jesus need a shaver? Well, no, because he had a beard. Uh, you can't imagine him using, there's no use of technology with gods, just as there's no use of technology with animals. What's interesting is these opposites of us. One extreme of us is the animal us, we are animals, and the other extreme is the divine. Well, those extremes meet. So the animal in us is also the divine in us. And that's why it's useful to reconnect with animals. It's not that I'm encouraging you to go out and buy a puppy or to watch nature documentaries. It has to remain more mental because you live in a big city called Seoul. It's when you look at animals, stop thinking you're looking at some little furry thing Consider that you're looking at something divine. It does not have rationality, just as gods don't have rationality, right? Why, are God, why do gods exist? Why do they do what they do? We have no idea. Our tools of rationality can tell us any number of things about modern medicine and earthquakes and a number of things, but they cannot explain to us the divine, because the divine is beyond the rational just like animals are beyond the rational. Ra of course, they have habits they have uh, to survive, but animals are not rational the way we are. Once again, the animal and the divine connect. So when I talk about the animal in us, I'm in a sense saying the same thing as saying the divine in us. They are the same. And we can be cynical about religion as we should be, but not too cynical, because then you're not only eliminating the divine in you, but you're also eliminating the animal. And that's basically negating yourself entirely. So I'd invite to you, next time you see in Seoul a squirrel, a sparrow, a bird, a dog, a cat, the little dog on your cell phone that you love so much, consider that that is looking at the divine. And the same thing when you go into a church and all its mistakes, if you think of it as being something animal-like, that the divine is the animal, that might reconnect you to what is essential and what is true about religion. Um, there, I see I've actually gone over time. So, um, well, that's it. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please ask them. 네, 첫 번째 질문입니다. 네, 어떤 방법으로 영감을 찾으시고 그에 몰입하기 위한 비결이 따로 있으실까요? 음... Um. Things I read, people I meet, thoughts that just pop into my head. My next novel inspired by, is inspired by the Trojan War, and that came as a result of reading a very good translation of the Iliad by an American translator named Stephen Mitchell. It's a mind-blowing work, the Iliad. Um, so in that case, it was something I read. Another book that I just finished that I wrote in three months, I've never written something so quickly, was, uh, is a meditation on Alzheimer's as a result of my mother. My mother has Alzheimer's. And so it's going to be a non-linear novel. It's going to be a box, a book in a box. You'll open the box, and it'll be in a box because the chapters won't be bound together. You can read the book in any order you want. You can shuffle the chapter. There'll be like little booklets, 27, 28, 30 booklets. Each is a chapter of this novel, but they're not bound together. So you can shuffle them like cards and read them in any order, sort of metaphor on, on Alzheimer's. That one was because of my mother. I didn't have to do any research in this one. I just sort of riffed on, on Alzheimer's. Um, so in that case, it was that experience. But as I said, with Life of Pi, it was India. Um, sometimes ideas just pop into your head. It's a wonderful feeling. So just that. As I said earlier, it's like a, you're being, being a vacuum cleaner. 네, 두 번째 질문입니다. 인생에서 가장 큰 어려움을 겪으셨을 때는 이를 어떻게 이겨내셨나요? 
You know what? None comes to mind. I've been very, very lucky. My parents love me. I've never had an accident. I've never been sick. Um, no one's ever attacked me. I've never been stabbed or shot at. Um, you know, there are moments of... Um, there are things I regret. As I said, I'll give you an example. I made my grandmother cry. I'm ashamed of that. Uh, you know, there are moments of cruelty when we're young. Cruelty to people, disrespect, um, that. But I've been very lucky. I started writing early and I got success early, undeservedly. I got a lot of success. I thought no one would read Life of Pi. I'm still amazed people read it. Um, so I, nothing comes to mind, really. And in terms of writing, I write very slowly and very little. So I make sure that I'm writing on a good project that I like. And it hasn't uh, proven very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Dyson Foundation for having me.